Chapter Five of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The bugle sounded taps. Although the portions of the house and grounds that were used by Wheeler included the most attractive spots, yet there were many forbidden places that were a real temptation to him. An especial one was the flower-covered arbor that had so charmed Genevieve, and another was the broad and beautiful north veranda. To be sure, the south piazza was equally attractive, but it was galling to be compelled to avoid any part of his own domain. However, the passing years had made the conditions a matter of habit, and it was only occasionally that Wheeler's annoyance was poignant. In fact, he and his wife bore the cross better than did Maida. She had never become reconciled to the unjust and arbitrary dictum of the conditional pardon. She lived in a constant fear lest her father should some day inadvertently and unintentionally step on the forbidden ground, and it should be reported. Indeed, knowing her father's quixotic honesty, she was by no means sure he wouldn't report it himself. It had never occurred, probably never would occur, and yet she often imagined some sudden emergency, such as a fire or burglars, that might cause his impulsive invasion of the other side of the house. In her anxiety, she had spoken of this to Samuel Appleby when he was there, but he gave her no satisfaction. He merely replied, a condition is a condition. Curtis Keefe had tried to help her cause by saying, surely a case of danger would prove an exception to the rule. But Appleby had only shaken his head in denial. Though care had been taken to have the larger part of the house on the Massachusetts side of the line, yet the rooms most used by the family were in Connecticut. Here was Mr. Wheeler's den, and this had come to be the most used room in the whole house. Mrs. Wheeler's sitting-room, which her husband never had entered, was also attractive. But both mother and daughter invaded the den, whenever leisure hours were to be enjoyed. The den contained a large South Bay window, which was Maida's favorite spot. It had a broad, comfortable window seat, and here she spent much of her time hurled up among the cushions reading. There were long curtains, which half-drawn hid her from view, and often she was there for hours without her father's knowing it. His own work was engrossing. Cut off from his established law business in Massachusetts, he had at first felt unable to start anew in different surroundings. Then, owing to his wife's large fortune, it was decided that he should give up all business for a time. And as the time went on, and there was no real necessity for an added income. Wheeler had indulged in his hobby of book collecting, and had amassed a library of unique charm as well as goodly intrinsic value. Moreover, it kept him interested and occupied, and prevented his becoming morose or melancholy over his restricted life. So, many long days he worked away at his books, and Maida hidden in the window seat, watched him lovingly in the intervals of her reading. Sitting there the morning after Samuel Appleby's departure, she read not at all, although a book lay open on her lap. She was trying to decide a big matter, trying to solve a vexed question. Maida's was a straightforward nature. She never deceived herself. If she did anything against her better judgment, even against her conscience, it was with open eyes and understanding mind. She used no sophistry, no pretense, and if she acted mistakenly, she was always satisfied to abide by the consequences. And now she set about her problem, systematically and methodically determined to decide upon her course, and then strictly follow it. She glanced at her father, absorbed in his book catalogues and indexes, and a great wave of love and devotion filled her heart. 
surely no sacrifice was too great that would bring peace or pleasure to that martyred spirit that he was a martyr maida was as sure as she was that she was alive she knew him too well to believe for an instant that he had committed a criminal act it was an impossibility for one of his character but that she could do nothing about the question had been raised and settled when she was too young to know anything about it and now her simple duty was to do anything she might to ease his burden and to help him to forget and she said to herself first of all he must stay in this home he positively must and that's all there is about that now if he knows if he has the least hint that there is another heir he'll get out at once or at least he'll move heaven and earth to find the heir and then we'll have to move and where to that's an unanswerable question anyway i've only one sure conviction i've got to keep him from all knowledge or suspicion of that other heir maybe it isn't true maybe mr appleby made it up but i don't think so at any rate i have to proceed as if it were true and do my best and first of all i've got to hush up my own conscience i've too much of my father's nature to want to live here if it rightfully belongs to someone else i feel like a thief already but i'm going to bear that i'm going to live under that horrid conviction that i'm living a lie for father's sake maida was in earnest by nature and by training her conscience was actually sensitive to the finest shades of right and wrong she actually longed to announce the possibility of another heir and let justice decide the case but her fiala devotion was in this thing greater even than her conscience her mother too she knew would be crushed by the revelation of the secret but would insist on thorough investigation and if need be on renunciation of the dear home her mental struggle went on at times it seemed as if she couldn't live beneath the weight of such a secret then she knew she must do it what was her own peace of mind compared with her father's what was her own freedom of conscience compared with his tranquillity she thought of telling geoffrey allen but she argued he would feel as the others would indeed as she herself did that the matter must be dragged out into the open and settled one way or the other no she must bear the brunt of the thing alone she must never tell any one then the next point was would mr appleby tell he hadn't said so but she felt sure he would well she must do all she could to prevent that he was to return in a day or two by that time she must work out some plan must think up some way to persuade him not to tell what the argument would be she had no idea but she was determined to try her utmost there was one way but maida blushed even at the thought sam appleby young sam wanted to marry her had wanted to for a year or more many times she had refused him and many times he had returned for another attempt at persuasion to consent to this would enable her to control the senior appleby's revelations it would indeed be a last resort she wouldn't even think of it yet surely there was some other way the poor tortured child was roused from her desperate plannings by a cheery voice calling maida maida here's me geoffrey she cried springing from the window seat and out to greet him dear he said as he took her in his arms dear dear dearest what is troubling you trouble nothing how can i be troubled when you're here but you are you can't fool me you know never mind you can tell me later 
i've got three whole days how's that splendid how did it happen old bennett went off for a week's rest a doctor's orders and he said if i did up my chores nice and proper i could take a little vacation myself oh you peach you're twice as beautiful -er as ever a whirlwind embrace followed this speech and left maida breathless and laughing while her father smiled benignly upon the pair it was some hours later that as they sat under the big sycamore geoffrey allen begged maida to tell him her troubles for i know you're pretty well broken up over something he declared how do you know she smiled at him why my girl i know every shadow that crosses your dear heart do i wear my heart on my sleeve then you don't have to for me to see it i recognize the signs from your face your manner your voice your whole being is trembling with some fear or some deeply rooted grief so tell me all about it and maida told not the last horrible threat that Samuel Appleby had told her alone, but the state of things as Appleby had presented it to Daniel Wheeler himself. And so you see, Jeff, it's a deadlock. Father won't vote for young Sam. I don't mean only vote, but throw all his influence. And that means a lot on Sam's side. And if he doesn't, Mr. Appleby won't get him pardoned. You know we hoped he would this year yes dear it would mean so much to us yes and to dad and mother too well there's no hope of that unless father throws himself heart and soul into the appleby campaign and he won't do that of course not he couldn't jeff he'd have to subscribe to what he doesn't believe in practically subscribe to a lie and you know father yes and you too and myself none of us would want him to do that maida doesn't necessity ever justify a fraud jeff the question was put so wistfully that the young man smiled nixy and you know that even better than i do dear why maida what i love you most for yes even more than your dear sweet beauty of face is the marvelous beauty of your nature your character your flawless soul attracted me first of all even as i saw it shining through your clear honest eyes oh geoffrey and made his clear eyes filled with tears i'm not honest i'm not true blue then nobody on this green earth is don't say such things dear i know what you mean that you think you want your father to sacrifice his principles in part at least to gain his full pardon thereby see how i can read your thoughts but you don't really think that you only think you think it if the thing came to a focus you'd be the first one to forbid the slightest deviation from the line of strictest truth and honor oh jeff do you think i would of course i think so i know it you are a strange make-up maida on an impulse i can imagine you doing something wrong even something pretty awful but with even a little time for thought you couldn't do a wrong what maida was truly surprised i could jump into any sort of wickedness i didn't quite put it that way jeff laughed but well you know it's my theory that given opportunity anybody can yield to temptation nonsense it's a poor sort of honor that gives out at a critical moment not at all most people can resist anything except temptation given a strong enough temptation and a perfect opportunity and your staunchest most conscientious spirit is going to succumb i don't believe that you don't have to and maybe it isn't always true but it often is howsoever 
it has no bearing on the present case your father is not going to lose his head and though you might do so he smiled at her i can't see you getting a chance you're not in on the deal in any way are you no except that mr appleby asked me to use all my influence with father which you've done yes it made not the slightest impression of course not i say maid young sam isn't coming down here is he not that i know of but maida couldn't help her rising color for she knew what Allan was thinking just let him try it that's all just let him show his rubicon countenance in these parts if he wants trouble does anybody ever want trouble maida smiled a little why of course they do sometimes they want it so much that they borrow it i'm not doing that i've had it offered to me in full measure heaped up pressed down and running over poor little girl don't take it so hard dearest i'll have a talk with your father and we'll see how matters really stand i doubt it's as bad as you fear and anyway if no good results come our way things are no worse than they have been for years your father has lived fairly contented and happy let things drift and in another year or two after the election is a thing of the past we can pick up the pardon question again by that time you and i will be where will we be maida i don't know jeff well we'll be together anyway you'll be my wife and if we can't live in boston we can live out of boston and that's all there is about that you'll have to come here to live there's enough for us all settle down here and sponge on your mother i see it but never you mind lady fair something will happen to smooth out our path perhaps this old tree will take it into its head to go over into massachusetts and so blaze a trail for your father and you oh very likely but i've renewed my vow jeff unless father can go into the state i never will all right sweetheart renew your vow whenever its time limit expires i'm going to fix things so no vows will be needed except our marriage vows will you take them dear when the time comes yes but maida did not smile and jeff watching her closely concluded there was yet some point on which she had not enlightened him however he asked no further question but bided his time guess i'll chop down the old tree while i'm here and ship it into massachusetts as firewood he suggested fine idea maida acquiesced but you'll only have your trouble for your pains you see the stipulation was without the intervention of human hands all right we'll chop it down by machinery then i wish the tree promise meant anything but it doesn't it was only made as a proof positive how impossible was any chance of pardon but now a chance of pardon has come yes but a chance that cannot be taken you'll be here jeff when they come back then you can talk with mr appleby and maybe as man to man you can convince him convince nothing don't you suppose i've tried every argument i know of with that old dutter head i've spent hours with him discussing your father's case i've talked myself deaf dumb and blind with no scrap of success but i don't mind telling you maida that i might have moved the old duffer to leniency if it hadn't been for you me yes you know well enough young sam's attitude toward you and old appleby as good as said if i'd give up my claim on your favor and give sunny sam a chance there'd be hope for your father hm indeed you don't say and you replied i didn't reply much of anything 
for if i'd said what i wanted to say he would have been quite justified in thinking that i was no fit mate for a christian girl let's don't talk about it that night maida went to her room leaving allan to have a long serious talk with her father she hoped much from the confab for jeff allen was a man of ideas and of good sound judgment he could see straight and could advise sensibly and well and maida hoped too that something would happen or some way would be devised that the secret told her by appleby might be of no moment perhaps there was no heir save in the old man's imagination or perhaps it was only someone who would inherit a portion of the property, leaving enough for their own support and comfort. At any rate, she went to bed comforted and cheered by the knowledge that Jeff was there, and that if there was anything to be done, he would do it. She had vague misgivings because she had not told him what Appleby had threatened. But, she argued, if she decided to suppress that bit of news, she must not breathe it to anybody, not even Jeff. So, encouraged at the outlook, and exhausted by her day of worriment, she slept soundly till well into the night. Then she was awakened by a strange sound. It gave her, at first, a strange impression of being on an ocean steamer. She couldn't think why for her half-awake senses responded only to the vague sense of familiarity with such a sound. But wide awake in a moment, she heard more of it, and realized that it was a bugle to which she listened, the clear, though not loud, notes of a bugle. Amazed, she jumped from her bed and looked out of a window in the direction of the sound. She saw nothing, and heard the last faint notes die away as she listened. There was no further sound, and she returned to bed, and after a time fell asleep again. She pondered over the occurrence while dressing next morning, wondering what it meant. Downstairs she found only Geoffrey in the dining room. "'Hear anything funny in the night, Maida?' he asked her. "'Yes, a bugle,' she returned. "'Did you hear it?' of course i did who plays the thing around here no one that i know of wasn't it rather strange rather i should say so made me think of the old english castles where spooks walk the parapets and play on bugles or bagpipes or some such doings oh those silly stories but this was a real bugle played by a real man how do you know by the sound spook bugles sound just the same how do you know how could they be heard if they didn't here's your father good morning mr wheeler who's your musical neighbor but daniel wheeler did not smile go up to your mother maida dear he said she she isn't well cheer her up all you can what's the trouble alan asked solicitously as maida ran from the room a strange thing my boy did you hear a bugle call last night yes sir it sounded taps is there a camp nearby no nothing of the sort now well to put it frankly there is an old tradition in mrs wheeler's family that a phantom bugler in that very way announces an approaching death good lord you don't mean she believes that she does and what can i say to disprove her belief we all heard it who could have done such a trick i don't know who but somebody did that bugle was played by a pair of good strong human lungs not by a spirit breath it sounded so but that doesn't affect mrs wheeler's belief if i could produce the bugler and get him to admit it she might believe him but otherwise she's sure it was the traditional bugler and that earthly days are numbered for someone of our little family 
you don't believe this foolishness sir i can't my nature rejects the very idea of the supernatural yet who could or would do it there's no neighbor who would and i know of no one round here who knows the tradition oh pshaw it's the merest casual occurrence a boy scout like as not or a gay young chap returning from a merry party there are lots of explanations quite apart from spooks i hope you can persuade mrs wheeler of that she is nervously ill and will hear of no rational explanation for the bugle call beg her to come down to breakfast do then we'll all jolly her up until she loses her fears but though allan's attempt was a brave one and ably seconded by mrs wheeler's husband and daughter they made not the slightest progress toward relieving her fears or disabusing her mind of her conviction end of chapter five Chapter Six of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Other Air. A general air of vague foreboding hung over the Wheeler household. Mrs. Wheeler tried to rally from the shock of the inexplicable bugle call, but though she was bright and cheerful, it was fully evident that her manner was forced and her gaiety assumed maida solicitous for her mother was more than ever resolved not to disclose the news of another possible heir to the estate though the more she thought about it the more she felt sure samuel appleby had spoken the truth she decided that he had learned of the other heir and that he was none too honest to be willing to keep the fact a secret if in turn he could serve his own ends she did not need to be told that if she would look on young sam with favor her father would perforce lend his aid to the campaign and in that case she knew that the other heir would never be mentioned again and yet the price the acceptance of young sam was more than she could pay to give up jeff allen her own true love and marry a man of such a different type and caliber as sam appleby was it was too much and jeff would have something to say about that yet she must decide for herself if she made the supreme sacrifice it must be done as if of her own volition if her parents or her lover guessed that she was acting under compulsion they would put an end to the project but could she even if willing to sacrifice herself could she ask sam appleby to take her yet she knew this would be the easiest thing in the world a mere hint to mr appleby that she approved of his son would bring the younger man down to the house at once and matters would then take care of themselves but could she do it she looked at jeff as he sat talking to her father his strong fine face alight with the earnestness of their discussion he was a man of a thousand her own geoffrey no she could not break his heart she had no right to do that it would be a crime to blot out the joy and happiness from the eager young face and then she looked at the other dear face her father worn and aging but still in rugged health could she let the inevitable happen and see him turned out of the home that he loved the home that had so long been his sanctuary his refuge from cold injustice of his fellow men and her mother almost ill from her fright and foreboding to add the disaster of poverty and homelessness no she couldn't do that and so poor maida wondered and worried her thoughts going round in a circle and coming back to the two men she loved and knew she must break one heart or the other at one moment her duty to her parents seemed preeminent then again she realized a duty to herself and to the man who loved her i don't know what to do 
she thought piteously i'll wait till mr appleby comes back here and then i'll tell him just how i'm placed perhaps i can appeal to his better nature but maida wheeler well knew that however she might appeal to samuel appleby it would be in vain she knew from the very fact that he came to her home and made the offers and threats that he did make that his mind was made up and no power on earth could move him from his decision he had a strong case he probably thought the offer of full pardon to dan wheeler and the offer to maida to keep quiet about another heir would he doubtless thought be sufficient to win his cause what an awful man he is she thought i wish he were dead i know i oughtn't to wish that but i do i'd kill him myself if it would help father i oughtn't to say that and i don't suppose i really would do it but it would simplify matters a lot and somebody said we are all capable of crime even the best of us well of course i wouldn't kill the old man but he better not give me a real good chance what are you thinking about little girl asked alan turning to her maida looked at him and then at her father and said deliberately i was just thinking how i'd like to kill samuel appleby senior junior or both laughed alan who thought little of her words save as a jest senior i meant but we may as well make it a wholesale slaughter don't maida her father looked grieved don't speak flippantly of such subjects well father why not be honest wouldn't you like to kill him no child not that but you'd be glad if he were dead there you needn't answer but if you were absolutely honest you'd have to admit it i'll admit it said her mother wearily samuel appleby has spoiled all our lives is still spoiling them he does it for his own selfish interests he has ruined the happiness of my husband myself my daughter and my prospective son-in-law is it any wonder that we should honestly wish he were dead it may not sound christian but it is an honest expression of human nature it is mrs wheeler and alan's face looked more pained than shocked but all the same we oughtn't to talk like that no indeed agreed wheeler please maida darling don't say such things and sarah if you must say them say them to me when we are alone it's no sort of talk for these young people's ears why i said it before mother did maida broke out and i mean it i'm at the end of my rope if that man is to hound us and torture us all our lives i can't help wishing him dead there there daughter please don't i won't dad i'll never say it again but i put myself on record and if the rest of you were honest you'd do the same thing that we'd like to kill him asked alan smiling at the idea i didn't say that i said we wish him dead if a nice convenient stroke of lightning came his way or made a hush her father spoke sternly i won't allow such talk it isn't like you my child and it isn't isn't good form i suppose she interrupted well i'll let up dads and i am a little ashamed of myself mother maybe the phantom bugler was announcing the death of old appleby hush maida what has got into you i'm incorrigible i guess you are and alan smiled fondly at her come out for a walk in the sunshine with me and get these awful thoughts out of your brain i know i'm a criminal said maida as they walked down a garden path but i can't help it i've more to bear than you know of jeff and you must make allowance i do sweetheart and i know how you're troubled and all that but don't say such dreadful things i know you don't mean them no i don't at least i don't think i do but i won't say them any more 
I think I lost my head. Forget it. You're upset and nervous, and your mother's worry reflects itself on you. Is there really a bugler tradition? Not over here. There was one connected with mother's family long ago in England, I believe. Of course, it was just one of those old spook yarns that most old houses have over there. But mother always remembered it. She has told everybody who ever visited here about it, and I think she always expected to hear the thing. Queer, though, wasn't it? Not very. It's explainable, by natural means, of course. Probably we'll never know who it was. But it was no phantom, be sure of that. Oh, well, it doesn't matter except that it has upset Mother so dreadfully. But she'll get over it if nothing happens. Nothing will happen. If by that you mean a death in the family, more likely a marriage will take place. Not ours, Jeff. I think that bugler sounded the death keel of our hopes. Maida, what is the matter with you? Why are you talking like that? I know you've something on your mind that you haven't told me yet. Something pretty serious, for it makes you say the strangest things. Tell me, darling, won't you? I can't, Jeff. I mean, there isn't anything. Wait till those people come back again. You'll be here, won't you? They're coming tomorrow. You bet I will. I'll see what I can do with old curmudgeon. You know I'm argumentative. That won't do any good with Appleby. What he wants is help from Dad. If he doesn't get that, he'll punish us all. And he can't get that, for your Dad won't give it. So it looks as if we must all take our punishment. Well, we're prepared. You wouldn't speak so lightly if you knew everything. That's why I ask you to tell me everything. Do, Maida. I'm sure I can help you. Wait till they come, was all Maida would say in response to his repeated requests. And at last they came. Smiling and hearty, Samuel Appleby re-entered the Wheeler home, apparently as self-assured and hopeful as when he left it. Keith was courteous and polite as always, and Genevieve Lane was prettier than ever by reason of some new Boston-bought clothes. Allen was introduced to the newcomers and sized up by one glance of Samuel Appleby's keen eyes. Privately, he decided that this young man was a very formidable rival of his son. But he greeted Allen with great cordiality, which Jeff thought it best to return, although he felt an instinctive dislike for the man's personality. Come along with me, Maida, and with daring familiarity, Genevieve put her hand through Maida's arm and drew her towards the stairs. I have the same room, I suppose, she babbled on. I've lots of new things I want to show you, and, she added as they entered the room and she closed the door, I want a talk fest with you before the others begin. What about? asked Maida, feeling the subject would be one of importance. Well, it's just this. And don't be too shocked if I speak right out in meetin'. I've determined to marry into this bunch that I'm working for. Have you? laughed Maida. Are they equally determined? I'm not joking. I'm in dead earnest. A poor girl has got to do the best she can for herself in this cold world. Well, I'm going to corral one of the three. Old man Appleby, young man Appleby, or Kurt Keith. Which one? For choice. Maida still spoke lightly. You don't think I'm in earnest, but I am. Well, I'd rather have young Sam. Next, I'd choose his father. And lastly, I'm pretty sure I could nail Curdy Keefe. Maida couldn't help her disapproval showing in her face, but she said, It isn't just the way I'd go about selecting a husband. But if it's your way, all right. Can I help you? Do you mean that? Why, yes, if I can do anything practical. Oh, you can. It's only to keep off the grass. Regarding young Sam. You mean not to try to charm him myself? Just about that. 
and I'll tell you why I say this. It seems old Appleby has about made up his mind that you're the right and proper mate for young Appleby. Oh, you needn't draw yourself up in that haughty fashion. He's good enough for you, miss. I didn't say he wasn't, and Maida laughed in spite of herself at Genevieve's manner. But truly, I don't want him. You see, I'm engaged to Mr. Allen. I know it, but that cuts no ice with Pa Appleby. He plans to oust Mr. Allen and put his son in his place. Oh, he does, does he? Maida's heart sank, for she had anticipated something like this. Am I to be consulted? Now look here, Maida Wheeler, you needn't take that attitude, for it won't get you anywhere. You don't know Mr. Appleby as I do. What he said goes. Goes. Understand? Maida went white. But such a thing as you speak of won't go, she exclaimed. I'm not sure it won't if he so ordains it, Miss Lane said gravely. But I just wanted your assurance that you don't hanker after Sammy Boy, so I can go ahead and annex him myself. In defiance of Mr. Appleby's intents? I may be able to circumvent him. I'm some little schemer myself. And he may die. What? Yep, he has an unsatisfactory heart, and it may go back on him at any minute. What a thing to bank on! It may happen all the same, but I've other irons in the fire. Run along now, I've work to do. You're a dear girl, Maida, and the time may come when I can help you. The round, rosy-cheeked face looked very serious, and Maida said gratefully, I may be very glad of such help, Genevieve. Then she went away. Samuel Appleby was lying in wait for her. Here you are, my girl, he said, as she came downstairs. Come for a ramble with me, won't you? And knowing that the encounter was inevitable, Maida went. Appleby wasted no time in preliminaries. I've got to go home tomorrow morning, he said. I've got to have this matter of your father's help in the campaign settled before I go. I thought it was settled, returned Maida calmly. You know he will never give you the help you ask. And, oh, please, Mr. Appleby, won't you give up the question? You have ruined my father's life, all our lives. Won't you cease bothering him? And whether you let him get his full pardon or not, won't you stop trying to coerce his will? No, I will not. You are very pleading and persuasive, my girl, but I have my own axe to grind. Now, here's a proposition. If you... I'll speak plainly. If you will consent to marry my son, I'll get your father's full pardon, and I'll not ask for his campaign support. Maida gasped. All her troubles removed at once. But at such a price! She thought of Alan, and a great wave of love surged over her. Oh, I can't! I can't! She moaned. What? are you mr appleby i love my chosen mate my fiance geoffrey allen would you ask me to give him up and marry your son whom i esteem highly but do not love certainly i ask just that you are free to say yes or no then i say no there must be some other way Give me some other chance, even though it be a harder one. All right, I will. Mr. Appleby's face was hard now. His lips set in a straight line. He was about to play his last card. All right, I will. Here it is. The other heir, of whom I spoke to you the other day, is Curtis Keefe. Mr. Keefe? Yes, but wait. He doesn't know it. I hit upon a clue in his chance reference to his mother's family, and unknown to him, I investigated genealogies and all that, and it is positive. He is the heir to all this estate, and not your mother. You're sure? Yes, absolutely certain. But remember, he doesn't know it. He has no idea of such a thing. 
Now, if you'll marry Sam, Keefe shall never know. I'll burn all the papers that I have in evidence. You and I will forget the secret, and your father and mother can rest in undisturbed possession here for the rest of their lives. And you won't insist on father's campaign work? If you marry my son, I rather think your father will lend his aid, at least in some few matters, without urging. But he shall not be urged beyond his wishes. Rest assured of that. In a word, Maida, all that you want or desire shall be yours except your choice of a husband. And I'll wager that inside of a year you'll be wondering what you ever saw in young Allen, and rejoicing that you are the wife of the governor instead. I can't do it. Oh, I can't. And then, too, there's Mr. Keefe and the airship. Mr. Keefe and the airship? exclaimed Curtis Keefe himself as he came round the corner and met them face to face. Am I to go up in an airship? And when? Appleby flashed a quick glance at Maida which she rightly interpreted to mean to let Keefe rest unenlightened as to his error. "'You're not the Mr. Keefe we meant,' said Appleby, smiling at his secretary. "'There are others.' And then Appleby walked away, feeling his best plan was to let Maida think things over. "'What Keefe is going up in an airship?' Kurt insisted, his curiosity aroused. I don't know, said Maida listlessly. Mr. Appleby was telling me some airship yarn. I didn't half listen. I, I can't bear that man. I can't blame you for that, Miss Wheeler. But we're going away tomorrow, and he'll be out of your way. No, he has me in a trap. He has arranged it so. Oh, what am I saying? Don't go on if you feel you might regret it. Of course, as Mr. Appleby's confidential secretary, I know most of his affairs. May I say that I'm very sorry for you, and may I offer my help, if you can use me in any way? How kind you are, Mr. Keefe. But if you know the details of the matter, you know that I am in a fearful dilemma. Oh, if only that man were out of existence. Oh, Miss Wheeler! And Keefe looked undisguisedly shocked. I don't mean anything wrong, Maida's eyes were piteous, but I don't know what to do. I've no one to confide in, no way to turn for help, for advice. Why, Miss Wheeler, you have parents, friends, no one that I can speak to. Forgive me, Mr. Keefe, but I am nearly out of my mind. Forgive me if I ask you to leave me, will you? of course you poor child i ought to have sensed that i was intruding with a courteous bow he walked away leaving maida alone on the seat beneath the old sycamore she thought long and deeply she seemed to grow older and more matured of judgment as she dealt with the big questions in her mind after a long time she came to her decision torn and racked with emotions she bravely faced the many-sided situation and made up her mind. Then she got up and walked into the house. That afternoon, about five o'clock, Appleby and Wheeler sat in the latter's den, talking over the same old subject. Maida, hidden in the window seat, was listening. They did not know she was there, but they would not have cared. They talked of nothing she did not already know. Appleby grew angry, and Wheeler grew angry. The talk was coming to a climax. Both men were holding on to their tempers, but it was clear one or the other must give way soon. Jeffrey Allen, about to go in search of Maida, saw a wisp of smoke curling from the garage, which from his seat on the north veranda was in plain view. He ran toward the smoke, shouting, Fire! as he ran, and in a few minutes the garage was ablaze. The servants gathered about. Mrs. Wheeler looked from her bedroom window, and Keefe joined Allen in attempts to subdue the flames. And with the efficient help of two chauffeurs, 
and other willing workers the fire was soon reduced to a smouldering heap of ashes Allen ran then to the den to tell them there that the danger was past he entered to see samuel appleby dead in his chair with a bullet through his heart daniel wheeler stood beside him gazing distractedly at the dead man maida white and trembling was half hidden as she stood just inside the curtains of the window not realizing that there was no hope of life Allen shouted for help and tore open appleby's coat to feel his heart he's quite dead he said in an awe-stricken tone but we must get a doctor at once i'll telephone spoke up genevieve's quiet voice and with her usual efficiency she found the number and called the doctor now the police she went on as if such matters belonged to her province certainly said curtis keefe who stood by his late employer taking charge by common consent who killed him said genevieve in a hushed tone as she left the telephone all looked from one to another but nobody replied mrs wheeler came to the doorway i knew it she cried the phantom bugler but the phantom bugler didn't kill him said genevieve and we must find out who did end of chapter six chapter seven of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain inquiries late the same evening the wheeler family and their guests were gathered in the living room much had been done in the past few hours the family doctor had been there the medical examiner had been called and had given his report and the police had come and were still present samuel appleby jr though no longer to be called by that designation was expected at any moment two detectives were there but one hallen by name said almost nothing seeming content to listen while his colleague conducted the questioning of the household burden the talkative one was a quick-thinking clear-headed chap decided of manner and short of speech now look here he was saying this was an inside job of course might have been one of the servants or might have been any of you folks how many of you are ready to help me in my investigations by telling all you know i thought we had to do that whether we're ready or not spoke up genevieve who was not at all abashed by the presence of the authorities of course we'll tell all we know we want to find the murderer just as much as you do keefe looked at her with a slight frown of reproof but said nothing the others paid no attention to the girl's rather forward speech in fact everybody seemed dazed and dumb the thing was so sudden and so awful the possibilities so many and so terrible that each was aghast at the situation the three wheelers said nothing now and then they looked at one another but quickly looked away and preserved their unbroken silence geoffrey allen became the spokesman for them it seemed inevitable for some one must answer the first leading questions and though curtis keefe and miss lane were in appleby's employ the detective seemed more concerned with the wheeler family bad blood wasn't there between mr appleby and mr wheeler burden inquired they had not been friends for years allen replied straightforwardly for he felt sure there was nothing to be gained by misrepresentation huh what was the trouble mr wheeler daniel wheeler gave a start then pulling himself together he answered slowly the trouble was that mr appleby and myself belonged to different political parties and when i opposed his election as governor he resented it and a mutual immunity followed which lasted ever since did you kill mr appleby wheeler looked at his questioner steadily and replied i have nothing to say that's all right you don't have to incriminate yourself he didn't kill him cried maida unable to keep still 
I was there in the room. I could see that he didn't kill him. Who did then? And the detective turned to her. I, I don't know. I didn't see who did it. Are you sure, miss? Better tell the truth. I tell you I didn't see. I didn't see anything. I had heard an alarm of fire, and I was wondering where it was. You didn't get up and go to find out? No, no, I stayed where I was. Where were you? In the window seat, in the den. Meaning the room where the shooting occurred? Yes, my father's study. And from where you sat you could see the whole affair? I might have if I had looked, but I didn't. I was reading. Thought you were wondering about the fire? Yes. Maida was quite composed now. I raised my eyes from my book when I heard the fire excitement. What sort of excitement? I heard people shouting, and I heard men running. I was just about to go out toward the north veranda, where the sounds came from, when I— I can't go on, and Maida broke down and wept. You must tell your story. Maybe it'll be easier now than later. Can't you go on, Miss Wheeler? There's little to tell. I saw Mr. Appleby fall over sideways. Didn't you hear the shot? No. Yes. I don't know. Maida looked at her father, as if to gain help from his expression, but his face showed only agonized concern for her. Dear child, he said, tell the truth. Tell just what you saw or heard. I didn't hear anything. I mean the noise from the people running to the fire so distracted my attention. I heard no shot or any sound in the room. I just saw Mr. Appleby fall over. You're not giving us a straight story, Miss Wheeler, said the detective bluntly. Seems to me you'd better begin all over. Seems to me you'd better cease questioning Miss Wheeler, said Curtis Keefe, looking sympathetically at Maida. She's just about all in, and I think she's entitled to some consideration. Hmm, pretty hard to find the right one to question. Mrs. Wheeler now. I'd rather not trouble her too much. Talk to me, said Alan. I can tell you the facts, and you can draw your deductions afterward. Me too, said Keefe. Ask us the hard questions, and then when you need to, inquire of the Wheelers. Remember, they're under great nervous strain. Well then, Burden seemed willing to take the advice. You start in, Mr. Keefe. You're Mr. Appleby's secretary, I believe? Yes, we were on our way back to his home in Stockfield. We expected to go there tomorrow. You got any theory of the shooting? I've nothing to found a theory on. I was out at the garage, helping to put out a small fire that had started there. How'd it start? I don't know. In the excitement that followed, I never thought to inquire. Tell your story of the excitement. I was at the garage with Mr. Allen and two chauffeurs, the Wheeler's man and Mr. Appleby's man. Together, and with the help of a gardener or two, we put the fire out. Then Mr. Allen said, Let's go to the house and tell them there's no danger. They may be worried. Mr. Allen started off and I followed. He preceded me into the den. Then you tell what you saw there, Mr. Allen. I saw, first of all, began Geoffrey, the figure of Mr. Appleby sitting in a chair near the middle of the room. His head hung forward limply, and his whole attitude was unnatural. The thought flashed through my mind that he had had a stroke of some sort, and I went to him, and I saw he was dead. You knew that at once? I judged so, from the look on his face and the helpless attitude. Then I felt for his heart and found it was still. You a doctor? No, but I've had enough experience to know when a man is dead. All right. What was Mr. Wheeler doing? Nothing. He stood on the other side of the room, gazing at his old friend. And Miss Wheeler? She, too, was looking at the scene. She stood in the bay window. 
I see. Now, Mr. Keefe, I believe you followed close on Mr. Allen's heels. Did you see the place, much as he described it? Yes. Keefe looked thoughtful. Yes, I think I can corroborate every word of his description. All right. Now, Miss Lane, where were you? I was at the fire. I followed the two men in, and I saw the same situation they have told you of. Genevieve's quiet, composed air was a relief after the somewhat excited utterances of the others. What did you do? I am accustomed to wait on Mr. Appleby, and it seemed quite within my province that I should telephone for help for him. I called the doctor, and then I called the police station. You don't think you took a great deal on yourself? Genevieve stared at him. I do not think so. I only think that I did my duty as I saw it, and in similar circumstances I should do the same thing again. At this point the other detective was heard from. I would like to ask, Howland said, what Mrs. Wheeler meant by crying out that it was the work of a phantom burglar. Not burglar, bugler, said Mrs. Wheeler, suddenly alert. Bugler? Howland stared. Please explain, madam. There is a tradition in my family, Mrs. Wheeler said in a slow, sad voice, that when a member of the family is about to die, a phantom bugler makes an appearance and sounds taps on his bugle. This phenomenon occurred last night. Oh, no! Spooks! But Mr. Appleby is not a member of your family. No, but he was under our roof, and so I know the warning was meant for him. Well, well, we can't waste time on such rubbish, interposed Burden. The bugle call had nothing to do with the case. How do you explain it, then? asked Mrs. Wheeler. We all heard it, and there's no bugler about here. Cut it out, ordered Burden. Take up the bugler business some other time, if you like, but we must get down to brass tacks now. His proceedings were interrupted, however, by the arrival of young Sam Appleby. The big man came in, and a sudden hush fell upon the group. Daniel Wheeler rose and put out a tentative hand, then half withdrew it as if he feared it would not be accepted. Hallen watched this closely. He strongly suspected Wheeler was the murderer, but he had no intention of getting himself in bad by jumping at the conclusion. However, Appleby grasped the hand of his host as if he had no reason for not doing so. "'I'm sorry, sir, you should have had this tragedy beneath your roof,' he said. Hallen listened curiously. It was strange he should adopt an apologetic tone, as if Wheeler had been imposed upon. "'Our sorrow is all for you, Sam,' Dan Wheeler returned, and then, as Appleby passed on to greet Maida and her mother, Wheeler sank back in his chair and was again lost in thought. The whole scene was one of constraint. Appleby merely nodded to Genevieve, and spoke a few words to Keefe, and then asked to see his father. On his return to the living room, he had a slightly different air. He was a little more dictatorial, more ready to advise what to do. The circumstances are distressing, he said, and I know, Mr. Wheeler, you will agree with me that we should take my father back to his home as soon as possible. That will be done tomorrow morning, as soon as the necessary formalities can be attended to. Now, Anything I can do for you people must be done tonight. You can do a lot, said Burden. You can help us pick out the murderer. For, I take it, you want justice done? Yes, yes, of course, Appleby looked surprised. Of course I want this deed avenged, but I can't help in the matter. I understand you suspect someone of the, the household. Now I shall never be willing to accuse anyone of this deed. If it can be proved the work of an outsider, a burglar, or highwayman, or intruder of any sort, I am ready to prosecute. But if suspicion rests on, on anyone I know, I shall keep out of it. 
you can't do that mr appleby said hallen you've got to tell all you know but i don't know anything i wasn't here you know about motives hallen said doggedly tell us now who bore your father any ill will and also had opportunity to do the shooting i shan't pretend i don't know what you're driving at and appleby spoke sternly but i've no idea that mr daniel wheeler did this deed i know he and my father were not on friendly terms but you need more evidence than that to accuse a man of murder we'll look after the evidence hallen assured him all you need tell about is the enmity between the two men an enmity of fifteen years standing appleby said slowly is not apt to break out in sudden flame of crime i am not a judge nor am i a detective but until mr wheeler himself confesses to the deed i shall never believe he shot my father wheeler looked at the speaker in a sort of dumb wonder maida gazed at him with eyes full of thankfulness and the others were deeply impressed by the just even noble attitude of the son of the victim of the tragedy but hallen mused over this thing he wondered why appleby took such an unusual stand and decided there was something back of it about which he knew nothing as yet and he determined to find out we can get in touch with you at any time mr appleby he asked oh yes of course after a few days after my father's funeral i will be at your disposal but as i've said i know nothing that would be of any use as evidence do you need to keep mr keefe and miss lane for any reason why i don't think so the detective said not longer than tomorrow anyhow i'll take their depositions but they have little testimony to give however you're none of you very far away no you can always get us at stockfield mr keefe will probably be willing to stay on and settle up my father's affairs and i know we shall be glad of miss lane's services for a time Alpaby glanced at the two as he spoke and they nodded well we're going to stay right here and burton spoke decidedly whatever the truth of the matter may be it's clear to be seen that suspicion must naturally point toward the wheeler family or some intruder though how an intruder could get in the room unseen by either mr wheeler or his daughter is pretty inexplicable but those things we're here to find out and we'll do it mr appleby i'm taking it for granted you want the criminal found oh i say mr er burden have a little common decency don't come at me with questions of that sort when i'm just about knocked out with this whole fearful occurrence have a heart man give me time to realize my loss before you talk to me of avenging it that's right said kurt keefe i think mr appleby deserves more consideration suppose we excuse him for the night somewhat reluctantly the detective was brought to consent and then daniel wheeler asked that he and his wife and daughter also be excused from further grilling that night we're not going to run away he said pathetically we'll meet you in the morning mr burden but please realize our stunned condition at present my mother must be excused maida put in i am sure she can stand no more and with a solicitous care she assisted mrs wheeler to rise from her chair yes i am ill the elder woman said and so white and weak did she look that no one could doubt her word the three wheelers went to their room and genevieve lane went off with them leaving allen and keefe with sam appleby to face the two detectives fire of questions you vamoose too sam keefe advised there's no use in your staying here and listening to harrowing details mr allen and i will have a talk with the detectives and you can talk tomorrow morning if you wish all right and appleby rose but look here keefe i loved and respected my father and i revere his memory and yes i want justice done of course but all the same if wheeler shot dad 
I don't want that poor old chap prosecuted. You know I never fully sympathized with father's treatment of him, and I'd like to make amends to Wheeler by giving him the benefit of the doubt, if it can be done. It can't be done, declared Burden, unwilling to agree to this heresy. The law can't be set aside by personal sympathy, Mr. Appleby. Well, I only said if it can be, and the man wearily turned and left the room. Now then, said Keefe, let's talk this thing out. I know your position, Alan, and I'm sorry for you. And I want to say right now, if I can help in any way, I will. I like the Wheelers, and I must say I subscribe to the ideas of Sam Appleby. But all that's up to the detectives. I've got to go away tomorrow, so I'm going to ask you, Mr. Burton, to get through with me tonight. I've lots to do at the other end of the route, and I must get busy. But I do want to help here, too. So at any rate, fire your questions at me, that is, if you know what you want to ask. I'll ask one right off, Mr. Keefe, and Helen spoke mildly but straightforwardly. Can you give me any fact or suggest to me any theory that points toward any one but Mr. Daniel Wheeler as the murderer of Samuel Appleby? Curtis Keefe was dismayed. What could he reply to this very definite question? A negative answer implicated Wheeler at once, while a yes would necessitate the disclosure of another suspect and Keefe was not blind to the fact that Howland's eyes had strayed more than once toward Maida Wheeler with a curious glance. Quickly making up his mind, Keefe returned. No fact, but a theory based on my disbelief in Mr. Wheeler's guilt, and implying the intrusion of some murderous-minded person. Meaning some marauder? Howland looked disdainful. Some intruder, Keefe said. I don't know who, or for what reason, but I don't think it fair to accuse Mr. Wheeler without investigating every possible alternative. There are several alternatives, Burton declared. I may as well say right out that I've no more definite suspicion of Mr. Wheeler than I have of Mrs. Wheeler or Miss Wheeler. What? And Geoffrey Allen looked almost murderous himself. Don't get excited, sir. It's my business to suspect. Suspicion is not accusation. You must admit all three of the Wheeler family had a motive. That is, they would, one and all, have been glad to be released from the thrall in which Mr. Appleby held them. And no one else present had a motive. I might suspect you, Mr. Allen, but that you were at the fire at the time, according to the direct testimony of Mr. Keefe. Oh, yes, we were at the fire, all right, Alan agreed, and I'd knock you down for saying to me what you did. Only you are justified. I would far rather be suspected of the murder of Mr. Appleby than to have any of the Wheelers suspected. But owing to Keefe's being an eyewitness of me at the time, I can't falsify about it. However, you may set it right down that none of the three Wheelers did do it, and I'll prove it. Go to it, Alan, Keefe cried. I'll help. You're two loyal friends of the Wheeler family, said Hallen in his quiet way, but you can't put anything over. There's no way out. I know all about the governor's pardon and all that. I know the feud between the two men was beyond all hope of patching up, and I know that tonight had brought about a climax that had to result in tragedy. If Wheeler hadn't killed Appleby, Appleby would have killed Wheeler. Self-defense? asked Allen. No, sir, not that. But one or the other had to be out of the running. I know the whole story, and I know what men will do in a political crisis that they wouldn't dream of at any other time. Wheeler's the guilty party, unless... Well, unless that daughter of his... Hush, cried Alan. I won't stand for it. I only meant that the girl's great love and loyalty to her father might have made her lose her head. No, she didn't do it, said Alan more quietly. Oh, I say, man, 
let's try to find this intruder that mr keefe has has invented put in burden no gentlemen they ain't no such animal now you tell me over again while i take it down just what you two saw when you came to the door of that den as they call it and so allen and keefe reluctantly but truthfully again detailed the scene that met their eyes as they returned from the fire they had put out the case is only too plain declared burden as he snapped a rubber band over his notebook sorry gentlemen but your story leaves no loophole for any other suspect than one of the three wheelers good night end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Confession. Before Sam Appleby left the next morning, he confided to Keefe that he had little, if any, faith in the detective prowess of the two men investigating the case. When I come back, he said, I may bring a real detective, and I may not. I want to think this thing over first, and, though I may be a queer dick, I'm not sure I want the slayer of my father found. I see, and Keefe nodded his head understandingly, but Geoffrey Allen demurred. You say that, Mr. Appleby, because you think one of the Wheeler family is the guilty party. But I know better. I know them so well. Not as well as I do interrupted appleby and neither do you know all the points of the feud that has festered for so many years if you'll take my advice mr allen you'll delay action until my return at least the detectives won't do that objected geoffrey the detectives will run around in circles and get nowhere scoffed appleby i shall be back as soon as possible and i don't mind telling you now that there will be no election campaign for me what exclaimed curtis keefe you're out of the running positively i may take it up again some other year but this campaign will not include my name my gracious exclaimed genevieve who knew a great deal about current politics who'll take your place a dark horse likely returned appleby speaking in an absorbed preoccupied manner as if caring little who fell heir to his candidacy i don't agree with you mr appleby spoke up jeff allen as to the inefficiency of the two men on this case seems to me they're doing all they can and i can't help thinking they may get at the truth all right if they get at the truth but it's my opinion that the truth of this matter is not going to be so easily discovered and those two bundlers may do a great deal of harm. Goodbye, Maida. Keep up a good heart, my girl. The group on the veranda said goodbye to Sam Appleby, and he turned back as he stepped into the car to say, I'll be back as soon as the funeral is over, and until then, be careful what you say, all of you. He looked seriously at Maida but his glance turned toward the den where mr wheeler sat in solitude i heard him stormed burden as the car drove away and the detective came around the corner of the veranda i heard what he said about me and hallen well we'll show him of course the reason he talks like that don't tell us the reason just now interrupted keefe we men will have a little session of our own without the ladies present there's no call for their participation in our talk. That's right, said Alan. Maida, you and Miss Lane run away, and we'll go to the den for a chat. No, not there, objected Burden. Come over and sit under the big sycamore. And so, beneath the historic tree, the three men sat down for a serious talk. Alan soon joined them, but he said little i'm leaving myself soon after noon said keefe i'll be back in a day or two but there are matters of importance connected with mr appleby's estate that must be looked after i should think there must be exclaimed burden i don't see how you can leave to come back very soon 
Keefe reddened slightly, for the real reason for his intended return was centered in Maida Wheeler's charm, to which he had incontinently succumbed. He knew Allen was her suitor, but his nature was such that he believed in his own powers of persuasion to induce the girl to transfer her affections to his more desirable self. But he only looked thoughtfully at Burton and said, There are matters here also that require attention in Mr. Appleby's interests. Well, Burton went on, as to the murder, there's no doubt that it was the work of one of the three wheelers. Nobody else had any reason to wish old Appleby out of the world. You forget me, said Allen in a tense voice. My interests are one with the wheelers. If they had such a motive as you ascribe to them, I had the same. Don't waste time in such talk, said Kurt Keefe. I saw you, Allen, at the fire during the whole time that covered the opportunity for the murder. Of course, agreed Burden. I've looked into all that, and so, as I say, it must have been one member of the Wheeler family, for there's no one else to suspect, including Mrs. Wheeler, quietly put in Hallen. How absurd, flared out Allen. It's bad enough to suspect the other two, but to think of Mrs. Wheeler is ridiculous. Not at all, said Burton. She has the same motive. She had opportunity. How do you know? asked Keefe. She ran down from her room at that very moment, stated Burton. I have the testimony of one of the upstairs maids, and also I believe Miss Wheeler saw her mother in the den. Look here, said Hallen, in his slow, drawling tones. Let's reconstruct the situation. You two men were at the fire. That much is certain, so you can't be suspected but all three of the Wheelers had absolute opportunity, and they had motive. Now, as I look at it, one of those three was the criminal, and the other two saw the deed. Wherefore, the two onlookers will do all they can to shield the murderer. Keefe stared at him. You really believe that? He said. Sure I do. Nobody else had either motive or opportunity. I don't for one minute believe in an outsider. Who could happen along at that particular moment, get away with the shooting, and then get away himself? Why, it could have been done, mused Keefe. And Allen broke in eagerly. Of course it could. There's nothing to prove it impossible. You two say that because you want it to be that way, said Burden, smiling at the two young men. That's all right. You're both friends of the family, and can't bear to suspect any one of them. But facts remain. Now let's see which of the three it most likely was. The old man, declared Hallen promptly. Nonsense, cried Allen. Mr. Wheeler is incapable of a deed like that. Why, I have known him for years. Don't talk about incapable of anything, said Burton. Most murderers are people whom their friends consider incapable of such a deed. A man who is generally adjudged capable of it is not found in polite society. Where's the weapon? asked Keefe abruptly. If Mr. Wheeler did it. Where's the weapon whoever did it? countered Burden. The weapon hasn't been found, though I've hunted hard but that helps to prove it was one of the family, for they would know where to hide a revolver, securely. If it was Mr. Wheeler, he'd have to hide it in the den, said Allen. He never goes over to the other side of the house, you know. It isn't in the den, Hallen spoke positively. I hunted that myself. You seem sure of your statement, said Keefe. Couldn't you have overlooked it? Positively not. No, he couldn't, concurred Burden. Hallen's a wonderful hunter. If that revolver had been hidden in the den, he'd have found it. That's why I think it was Mrs. Wheeler, and she took it back to her own rooms. Oh, not Mrs. Wheeler, groaned Jeff Allen. That dear, sweet woman couldn't. Incapable of murder, I suppose, ironically said Burden. Let me tell you, sir, many a time a dear sweet woman has done extraordinary things for the sake of her husband or children. But what motive would Mrs. Wheeler have? 
the same as the others appleby was a thorn in their flesh an enemy of many years standing and i've heard hints of another reason for the family's hating him besides that conditional pardon business but no matter about that now what i want is evidence against somebody against one of three suspects until i get some definite evidence i can't tell which of the three is most likely the one seems to me the fact that mrs wheeler ran downstairs and back again is enough to indicate some pretty close questioning of her suggested hallen oh please begged Allen. she's so upset and distracted of course she is but that's the reason we must ask her about it now when she gets calmed down and gets a fine yarn concocted there'll be small use asking her anything i'd tackle the old man first said hallen i think on general principles he's the one to make inquiries of before you go to the ladies let's go to him now no proposed burton let's send for him to come here this is away from the house and we can talk more freely i'll go for him offered Allen, seeing they were determined to carry out their plan not much said burden you're just aching to put a flea in his ear you go for him Allen. the detective went to the house and returned with daniel wheeler at his side the suspected man stood straight and held himself fearlessly not an old man he was grayed with care and trouble but this morning he seemed strong and alert as any of them put your questions he said briefly as he seated himself on one of the many seats beneath the old sycamore first of all who do you think killed samuel appleby this question was shot at him by burden and all waited in silence for the answer i killed him myself was the straightforward reply that settles it said Hallen. it was one of the women what do you mean by that cried wheeler turning quickly toward the speaker i mean that either your wife or daughter did the deed and you are taking the crime on yourself to save her no reasserted dan wheeler you're wrong i killed appleby for good and sufficient reason i'm not sorry and i accept my fate wait a minute said Hallen, as keefe was about to protest where was your daughter miss maida when you killed your man i i don't know i think she was gone to the fire which had just broken out you're not sure i am not she had been with you in the den i don't know well i know she had she had been sitting in her favorite window seat in the large bay and was there while you and mr appleby were talking together also she did not leave the room to go to the fire for no one saw her anywhere near the burning garage as to that i can't say went on wheeler slowly but she was not in the den to my knowledge at the time of the shooting very well let that pass now then mr wheeler if you shot mr appleby what did you afterward do with the revolver i i don't know the man's face was convincing his frank eyes testified to the truth of his words i assure you i don't know i was so so bewildered that i must have dropped it somewhere i never thought of it again but if you had merely dropped it it must have been found and it hasn't been somebody else found it and secreted it suggested Hallen probably mr wheeler's wife or daughter perhaps so assented wheeler calmly they might have thought to help me by secreting it have you asked them yes and they deny all knowledge of it so do i but surely it will be found it must be found and therefore it is imperative that the rooms of the ladies as well as your own rooms sir be thoroughly searched all right go ahead and search wheeler spoke sharply i've confessed the crime now waste no time in useless chattering get the evidence get the proofs and let the law take its course you will not leave the premises put in Hallen, and his tone was that of command rather than inquiry i most certainly shall not declared wheeler but i do ask you gentlemen 
to trouble and annoy my wife and daughter as little as possible their grief is sufficient reason for their being let alone hm grunted burden well sir i can promise not to trouble the ladies more than is necessary but i can't help feeling necessity will demand a great deal mrs wheeler was next interviewed and the confab took place in her own sitting-room none of her family was allowed to be present and the four men filed into the room with various expressions of face the two detectives were stolid looking but eagerly determined to do their work while Allen and Keefe were alertly interested in finding out some way to be of help to Mrs. Wheeler. She received the men quietly, even graciously, sensing what they had come for. "'To start with, Mrs. Wheeler,' said Burton, frankly but not unkindly, "'who do you think killed Mr. Appleby?' "'Oh, I don't know. I don't know,' she wailed, losing her calm and becoming greatly agitated. "'Where were you when the shot was fired?' asked Helen. "'I don't know. I didn't hear it. "'Then you were up in your own room?' "'I suppose so. I don't know. "'You were up there when the fire broke out?' "'Yes. I think I was. "'But you must know, Mrs. Wheeler, "'that is, you must know where you were "'when you first heard of the fire. "'Yes, yes, I was up in my bedroom.' and who told you of the fire my maid rachel and then what did you do i i i don't remember you ran downstairs didn't you i don't remember yes you did burton took up the reins you ran downstairs and just as you got down to the den you saw you saw your husband shoot mr appleby his harsh manner as he intended frightened the nervous woman and reduced her to the verge of collapse but after a gasping moment she recovered herself and cried out i did not i shot mr appleby myself that's why i'm so agitated i knew it exclaimed burton mr wheeler's confession was merely to save his wife now mrs wheeler i believe your story and i want all the particulars first why did you kill him be because he was my husband's enemy and i had stood it as long as i could hm and what did you do with the weapon you used i threw it out of the window and it dropped on the lawn not dropped i threw it far out as far as i could oh i see out of which window why why the one in the den the bay window but your daughter miss maida was sitting in the bay window no she was not mrs wheeler spoke emphatically now she was not in the room at all she had gone to the fire oh is that so and then what happened next why nothing i i ran upstairs again appalled at what you had done not appalled so much as as unnerved yes unnerved i fell on my bed and rachel looked after me ah yes we will interview rachel and so save you further harrowing details come on men let's strike while these irons are hot the four filed from the room and burton spoke in a low tone but excitedly come quickly there goes miss maida across the lawn we will take her next the maid rachel can wait inwardly rebelling but urged on by the others jeff allen went along and as burton stopped maida on her quick walk across the lawn jeff put his arm through that of the girl and said do as they tell you dear it's best to have this matter settled at once again the party grouped themselves under the old sycamore and this time maida was the target for their queries tell me all you know of the case she said peremptorily then I'll tell you what I know. We know that the murder was committed by one of you three wheelers, said Burton brutally. Now both your parents have confessed to being the criminal. What? Maida cried, her face white and her eyes big and frightened. Yes, madam, just that. Now what have you to say? 
are you going to confess also of course i am for i am the real criminal can't you see that my father and mother are both trying to shield me i did it because of that awful man's hold on my father take my confession and do with me what you will here's a state of things cried burton truly surprised at this new development the girl is telling the truth exclaimed curtis keefe not because he really thought so but his quick mind told him that it would be easier to get a young girl acquitted than an older person and he saw the plausibility of the detective's theory that it must have been one of the three wheelers all right burton went on then miss wheeler enlighten us as to details where's the weapon i don't have to tell you anything except that i did it do i jeffrey do i mr keefe she looked at these two for help no miss wheeler keefe assured her you needn't say a word without legal advice but maida jeffrey groaned you didn't do it you know you couldn't have yes i did jeff maida's eyes were glittering and her voice was steady of course i did i'd do anything to save father from any more persecution by that man and there was to be more oh don't let me talk i mustn't no you mustn't agreed keefe now burden you've got three confessions what are you going to do with them going to find out which one is the true one answered burden with a dodged expression i knew all the time it was one of the three and i'm not surprised that the other two are willing to perjure themselves to save the criminal also there may have been collusion suggested howland of course the other agreed but we'll find out the whole thing rests among the three they must not be allowed to escape i've no intention of running away said maida proudly no one will run away opined howland sagariously the criminal will stand by the other two and the other two will stand by him or her as the case may be supplemented burden her maida assured him in the first place my mother was upstairs in her own room and my father was not in the den at the time i was there alone oh yes your father was in the den cried geoffrey imploringly no said maida not catching his meaning but howland caught it where was mr wheeler he asked i-i don't know maida said well if he wasn't in the den and if he wasn't upstairs maybe he was in the big living room looking out at the fire yes yes i think he was maida agreed then howland went on then mr wheeler broke his parole and is due for punishment oh no maida moaned seeing where her statements had led i-i guess he was in the den after all and i guess you're making up as you go along opined mr howland End of chapter 8